Hello students, welcome back. Myself Pushpendra Singh and uh, we are uh, studying the history for class 66. And this would be your this would be our third class. So we have covered the two classes in the history book. And this would be your NCRT based classes. So you will be having daily targets uh, to study your N NCRT books. You can prepare well. All right, so let's start with the class. Okay. So we have covered in our last class, uh, the first two chapters. All right, so first two chapters, sorry, first five chapters. Now we are going to start with another chapters. Okay, so let's begin with the class. So there was kingdoms, king and early republic. This is the title of the chapter. So you first understand the terminology, then we'll move further. All right, so what, who were the Rajas, right? So you must understand as we discussed yesterday, like in the in the Rig Veda, you have seen that there are the hymns in the Rig Veda, right? These hymns were basically used right during the sacrificial prayer. Now, after continuing of that, you must understand there were rajas also. These rajas used to perform some sacrifice, just say as to make yagya. So sacrifice, matlab, jo perform the perform some sort of a sacrifice. The sacrifice may be related to, for example maybe related to some animals or maybe some sort of a, you know, other belonging there. So all sort of a big sacrifice now be recognized as a part of Rajas of Janpadas, right? Rather than Janas. So these, these were considered as the Rajas on that time who basically performed the big sacrifice. Only those people or only those, you know, the, the leaders were, con were recognized as a Rajas than Janpadas, right? So you must understand the Janpada is made up of two words. The word is, the first is Jana. The Jana means basically the land, right? Sorry, Jana where the Jana set its foot. So that is settled down. So you must understand the Janapada literally means the land where the Jana has set its foot. Jana means the people has set its foot. So that was Jana Pada. Pada means basically your foot. So ultimately where you put your foot, ultimately who the put, ultimately the rulers who were basically the part of Janpada who put their feet on the land. So name itself basically come from these two words. Okay. Now let's understand these Janapadas. What does it mean by Janapada means? Okay. So as we discuss archaeology, archaeologists, so archaeologists are those people or those professional who basically involve in excavation, extraction of the ancient remains. So they basically study, you know, all sort of the remains that are there either in the form of say pottery, grain remains or dead remains or any, any sort of, you know, the dead remains of uh, some other material, which is, which is basically belong to the past. So these archaeologists have excavated the number of settlements, okay, uh, in these Janapadas, right? For example, some of the settlements, you can say that, for example, uh, nearby Merat, you have Hastinapur, right? In Delhi itself, you have Purana Kila. So these are some of the settlements which were which were previously part of some Janapadas. Now, they also found that the people used to live in the huts on that time, right? During Janapadas time, the people used to live in the huts and they used to they used to cat or they used to demo, domesticate some cattle also like buffalo, right? And all, they also have the knowledge regarding the growing of different type of varieties of the crops. For example, they used to grow rice wheat, barley, pulses, sugarcane, sesame, and mustard. So that means they domesticate animals. They domesticate basically also the crops, right? So they, they have the knowledge about the crop, crop growing also. Now, they also use the earthen pots also. For example, few of the earthen pots are grayware or they are colored in the gray or red, right? So they have basically red or gray colored earthen pots also been found in this uh, in this basically Janapadas and one special type of pottery was also found. They are called painted gray ware. So this is basically painted in a gray. So they are, this, they are basically called painted gray ware type of pottery have been found in Janapadas, right? Now you must understand after reading these three, four, five, six points, right? You must understand that these are their general characteristics that the people who lived in the Jan Janapadas have knowledge of uh, of rearing of animals, they domesticate animals, they also cultivate crops, they use some earthen pots, they are colored also, and they have special type of pottery, they are also colored, they are called 
painted grey ware type of pottery. Right now, let's understand Mahajanapadas. Now, Janapada, you understand where the people first put their feet. Now, first first put their foot. That means the people one step out and where they started living. Now, few of those Janap, few of those Janapadas also become become more prominent, more important than other Janapadas. So you must understand Janapadas are general names that are given to the different different localities. But when you say Mahajanapada. Mahajanapada means only those Janapadas which become more prominent, more important, and they are well known for a particular particular thing. They are called basically Mahajanapadas. Okay, they are called Mahajanapadas. Now there is there is some peculiar distinction between Mahajanapada and Janapada that you must understand. Okay, the Mahajanapada had a capital city with them, but unlike the Janapada, which does not have any sort of a capital city. And many of the Mahajanapadas are fortified also. Just like your kilas, etc., in Rajasthan, etc., in that, us tarah se the Mahajanapadas also fortified because they need certain type of protection, and they have the capital city also, right? And they made this huge walls out of brick or stones or wood also. So they made this basically a masonry wall all around your capital city. Okay, now. Uh, you might have understand that these forts would have would have or probably would have built right to basically you know for protection purpose for security purpose right because they are also afraid of, afraid of the attacks of other people also or other kings also now no there can be another reason also for example one one reason could be the security reason another reason could be the rulers want to show that how rich they are how powerful they are so they basically built a really really big wall very very big wall right uh, very impressive walls right very impressive forts so they want to project their strength they want to project their wealth that they are much wealthier than another kings than another kings this mahajanapada is much much wealthier so that can be one of the reason also right now you must understand the land and the people who lives inside the fortified land fortified land means the land which was fortified by the king now it is more easily controlled by the king also there could be a third reason right so there can be three reason one is right to for the protection for the security reason another reason is right for uh, projecting its strength and the wealth and third reason right to control the population also because ultimately the king has to control its population so it will it will be easier for the king to control the population that is why they have uh started fortifying of these lands understand so these are mahajanapadas the mahajanapadas has capital city and most of the mahajanapadas are fortified and mahajanapadas are janapadas only but they are more prominent they are more important than than another janapadas all right now another characteristics of mahajanapada is they built such a huge walls which is required to great deal of planning so that means a uh, element of planning was also involved in the in the mahajanapada also right thousands of the bricks and the stones were prepared because you need to you need to make a a big big wall so you need basically thousands of the stones bricks pieces and etc and so forth they need to uh, they need to assemble so they have started some sort of a planning to make such type of walls now they also need a big labor provided by the thousands of the men and people and children women across all found in all of the locality so that means they started right uh, they started you know moving towards a professionalism right for example if they need the lab, if they need to construct the the building or the the walls they need basically the labor class right if they make you know some implement that will construct those walls they also need certain amount of say carpenters and all sort of all sort of things so well defined you know different professions also started emerging in the mahajanapadas now the new rajas also begin maintaining this army because once they fortified it they need to protect it from the from the enemy also so they started maintaining this army but before janapada what we what we learned in the in the rigveda in the last class that they were they were rajas but these rajas were were totally different than the than the contemporary rajas these rajas does not have first of all fortified capital cities previously in the rigveda period time they did not maintain any sort of a army and moreover these these rajas were well capable enough right 
to defend themselves right and people used to choose them people used to choose them but now these rajas are something different they started maintaining their armies the soldiers are are paid regularly salaries right and they are maintained by the king regularly throughout the years and payment were made either through the you know coins or some sort of other you know other entitlement like land etc okay now let's understand the taxes the tax okay so first of all you must understand the kings who basically ruled this mahajanapada you say them rulers right so rulers who were basically ruling this mahajanapadas once they built the huge fort and they also started felting the need of maintaining the huge army to protect the protect that fort protect that basically fort so they need more and more resources first to pay the huge amount of money to the to the army second to maintain that fort also so they need money they need money so they started thinking of collecting the tax also right to manage all such you know uh, things so they started basically uh, they felt first time that there should be need to collect the taxes also right so instead of depending on the occasional gift that he, they used to receive from the people they started thinking of you know getting the money through regular taxes through the regular taxes and that is how they basically started this process now taxes on the crops were but the most important one right the whoever the farmers grow, grow the crops right they used to you know, they used to put the tax on the crops right and they were and this was the this was because most people were farmers on that time because everyone has owning the land not everyone but most of the people having the occupation called farming so they will get uh, you know the big chunk of money from the farmers itself now this tax what we are talking about in that period of the time say in the mahajanapada time is was was fixed around 1/6 of what was produced jaise aapke paas 100 kg grains were produced so 1/6 of the 100 kg would be would be paid as a tax during mahajanapada so it was fixed at 1/6 amount of the, the produce that you produce that was produced right and it was known as a bhaga or share so that amount of bhaga or share the farmer used to give to the basically to the rulers now there were taxes on the craft persons also theek hai there were different different crafts the, the persons associated with called craft persons now uh, this could have been in the form of labor so for example if the craft person you know a uh, uh, craft person basically you know uh, made some business in the in the basically kingdom right the what could be the tax for them the tax could be that you work for a minimum amount of days uh, to the service of king to the service of ruler so that means the tax could be in the form of labor also right you work this many amount of day in the in the service of king so that could be one of the uh, one form of basically a tax okay for example you can say that a weaver or a smith may have to work for a day every month for the king so for example if they are earning something in the kingdom if they work one day free of cost to the king it will be almost synonymous to the tax paid by the farmers it is considered like that only okay the herders who also expected to the pay the tax in the form of animals and animal produce so the tax related tax related parameters were different it is not solely in the form of monetary terms you see here they are not in the form of monetary terms but they but they are in the different different forms say uh, the craft person has to pay in the form of its labor the herders used to pay in the form of its animals okay its animal process in animal produce right so they were they were you know the different different form basically right the people who basically you know brought the goods like merchants right they used to pay the tax in the form of say the goods right so there were different different things the hunters and the gatherers also had to produce the forest produce to the rajas so these were different type of you know taxes were paid by the different people in the in the mahajan in the mahajanapada period all right let's understand agriculture let's understand agriculture what was the condition of the agriculture on that time so you must understand the two major changes in the agriculture were made on that time right the first one is uh, the growing use of iron plowshares plus okay previously you had the wooden plowshares right now uh, now this because of fortification because of growing of the need and because of you know uh, growth of you know uh, the iron use of you know different type of implements 
the the rulers also started thinking of using the iron shares okay so the iron shares was greatly used right this means that the heavy clay soil could be turned over better than the blood than the wooden shares obviously if some implement made up of wood it cannot turn the heavy and clay soil it can be better turned by you know uh, by the iron plus shares right which can basically can produce a good amount of growth of the crops second the people begin transplanting the paddy also right you must understand this mean that instead of scattering the seed on the ground scattering process aap jante hai na ki fek dena bas simply fek dena right from from which the plants can be sprout right now these saplings were grown and then planted in the fields just like that today also the saplings were grown and then they are ultimately planted in the in the grounds where they they ultimately gives you the rice they ultimately gives you the rice so they started feeling in the form of your basically you know uh, different type of you know the agriculture practices that were there during majarpada this has led to the increased production and many more plants were survived on that time and generally uh, who were involved during mahajanapada period so you can say that only the slave men and women only the person who were considered as a slave men and women like they are called dasas and dasis right as well as the landless agricultural laborers laborers that are called kamakaras that basically do the work in the Uh, in basically in the agricultural fields so only the slaves only the slaves or landless agricultural laborers now you must understand this terminologies they can ask you or upsc can ask you in the objective questions who were kamakaras so kamakaras were basically agricultural laborers who were dasas and dasis they were slave men and slave women who used to work in the agricultural field all right so this is clear now let's understand some of the kingdoms also let's understand some of the kingdoms also for example magadh magadh is a kingdom okay magadh was the kingdom so right so magadh who became the most important mahachanpada in about 200 years right so it took around 200 years to become the most important kingdom or mahajanpada during that period of the time many rivers like ganga son flowed through the mahajanpada or flowed through this mahajanpada which is also called magadh and this because of this flowing of ganga and its tributary like son uh, this area is also important for transportation purpose because the rivers are perennial in the nature they used to flow throughout the years right this area is also known for the water supply because fresh water supply you know uh, through the irrigation channels through you know uh, different you know uh, different mechanisms can be uh, transported then making the land fertile the land land was also fertile because enough amount of uh, you know water is available for irrigation and moreover the soil was also fertile because of the alluvial soil brought brought by the rivers alluvial soils brought by the river so this has led to the the uh, the development of magadh kingdom as one of the strongest kingdom one of the strongest kingdom all right so these are some of uh, you know uh, the peculiar features why the magadh was the strongest kingdom on the time and moreover the part of the magadha was forested also right so you must understand this forested land were basically utilized by the kingdom for its defense for example the elephants which lived in the forest right could be captured and can be trained by the by the rulers to uh, to you know uh, for the preparation of the battle for the preparation of the battle so that means they can be integrated in the army also so this has all factors which has led to the development of magadh as a one of the strongest kingdom or one of the strongest mahajanpada on that time now now other peculiar features or other characteristic characteristic feature why this magadha was one of why this magadha was you know uh, one of the strongest kingdom is that the forest are also provided wood for building houses okay so you must understand different type of chariots were used different type of carts were used during uh, during the war you might have seen through mahabharata 
right? So there were chariots who used to, uh, you know, carry different type of peoples like king, queens, and etc. and so forth. So these forests basically used for wood purpose also. Besides, there were iron ore mines also in that region, right? So that iron ore mines were basically used for construction or for the manufacturing of the strong tools and the weapons. And these strong tools and the weapons used basically uh, uh, to defend the Magadha Empire also. And moreover, Magadha has two very powerful rulers on that time. The one is called Bimbisara and the second is called Ajat Shatru, right? So these were two most powerful rulers who ruled by all possible means, right? So who used basically all possible means to conquer ever to conquer other Janapadas. So they started conquering the other regions also. And they, by that time, they become so powerful that other Janapadas started, you know, uh, 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 fearing out of these two rulers, right? Uh, you can say that Mahapadma Nanda, right, was the another important ruler apart from Bimbisara and Ajatsatru, right? Uh, this Mahapadma Nanda basically extended his control up to the northwest part of subcontinent, which has further, in, which has further, you know, enhanced the scope of the kingdom of Magadha. Then Rajgriha, Rajgriha, the present day Rajgir in the Bihar was the capital of Magadha for several years. Okay, so you must understand the Magadha is the name itself, you know, we used in the ancient time, it is basically the area which is located in the Bihar state. Okay, the capital of the Magadha kingdom was Rajgir. Okay, it was also called Rajgriha, Rajgriha, which was basically a capital of Magadha for several years together. Okay, now later this capital was shifted to Patliputra. Patliputra ko abhi hum kya bolte Patna. Patna. Right? So you must understand the, the capital, there were two capitals, right? The first capital was basically Rajgriha, which was also called Rajgir. The Rajgir is still is a district in, in the Patna, okay? Uh, in, sorry, in the Bihar. And later this capital was shifted to Patliputra. The Patliputra in the present day is known as Patna. Is known as Patna. So, which is, which is basically, you must understand that these are the two capitals of uh, the Magad kingdom. Now, more than 2300 years ago, a ruler named Alexander, Alexander the Great, you might have heard about, who conquered the world also, right? Who, who basically lived in the Macedonia in Europe, right? Now, this Alexander the Great wanted to become conqueror, wanted to become world conqueror, that he should conquer all, all world, right? So he decided that he should march. He should march towards Indian continent, right? So what happens is, uh, though he did not conquer the world, but you must understand, he did conquer the parts of Egypt and West Asia on that time, right? Uh, on that time, the Magadha kingdom was flourishing. Now, since he captured the part of Egypt and West Asia, so he came very close to the Indian continent, Indian subcontinent on that time. So he reached up to the banks of Bees. Bees. So Bees is basically tributary of Indus River. You must understand. So Bees is a tributary of Indus River. So he basically reached to the very close or reaching up to the bank of Bees. Now what happens is when he decided to march further or march forward, right? his soldiers refused on that time. His soldier says, no, no. They have very strong army. They have very strong army. They have very, you know, uh, very strong foot soldiers. They have too much chariots. They have too much elephants, right? Even the numbers of those soldiers are very, very high. So the soldiers, you know, did not accept the version of marching into the, the Magadha kingdom on that time. So you can understand how powerful was the Magadha kingdom on that time that the Alexander the Great was also, you know, forced to recede back, forced to recede back, right? And his soldiers also refused to march ahead into the Magadha kingdom on the time because of the fear of, because of the fear of the rulers of Magadha kingdom. All right. Now, the next kingdom is Bajji kingdom. Okay. The first was Magadha. Magadha was the strongest kingdom. Let's understand the Bajji kingdom. Okay. So Bajji was also in the, Bajji was also in the Bihar. 
राइट वजी वो वजी हैज इट्स कैपिटल एट द वैशाली वैशाली अभी भी वहां पे प्लेस है सो वजी हैज इट्स कैपिटल इन द वैशाली ओके नाउ दिस वर अंडर डिफरेंट फॉर्म ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट फॉर एग्जांपल द वन नोन फॉर्म ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट इज गना और संघा गना और संघा ओके नाउ दीज वर नॉट नॉट दीज टू वर नॉट द सेम बट यू मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड बट दे हैव मेनी रूलर्स विद देम okay sometime even thousands of the men rule together and each one is known as raja so that sangha is not ruled by a particular person the sangha is not ruled by a particular person but they were ruled by many rulers many rulers together and they form a sangha sangha jaise apna buddhism ka sangha tha na ke they were consist of different people okay different pupils isi tarah se that gana or sangha was ruled by not one person but it is it is ruled by many rulers together so sometime you can say that even thousands of the men ruled together and each one of them is known as raja each one of them is known as raja i hope it is clear i hope it is clear so in the bajji kingdom which was which was a sangha or the the form of the government was sangha or gana this sangha does not have uh, or did not have any particular raja or ruler but it is a thousands of the people who rule this area and each one of these thousand people is known as raja is known as raja so this is a type of government in the bajji kingdom okay all right now these rajas perform rituals together now you must understand obviously the ritual sacrificial practices that is there the raja should perform now these raja should be performing these rituals sacrificial practices basically which which are one part of uh, you know the rulers to be performed right while he become a ruler now they also met in the assembly so there were assemblies together when these rajas used to meet right and they used to decide in the assembly what has to be done and there were lot of discussions and debate in the assembly so you must understand this type of functioning of the government is known as gana or sangha gana or sangha now now one of the biggest drawback of this system is that the woman is not allowed the woman was not allowed to participate in the assembly so it is only male dominated assembly no women were participating even no dasas dasas human slave slave laborers they were also not allowed and kamakars i told you kamakars means agricultural laborers agricultural laborers was also not allowed to participate in those assemblies right no when i say the buddha gautam buddha or siddhartha and mahavira both belong to gana or sangha so you must understand the gautam buddha which is also known as maha which is also known as you know siddhartha and mahavira both are belongs to these sanghas these sanghas and now once if you want to if you want to uh, have one of the greatest description about those sanghas apart from that the buddhist book will give you the beautiful descriptions about those sanghas about those sanghas all right now the rajas of powerful kingdom try to conquer the sanghas okay nevertheless this lasted for a very long time till about 1500 years ago when the last of the gana sangha was conquered by the gupta rulers now you must you must have some information about this bajji kingdom so bajji kingdom was uh, in the bihar and its capital was baishali which is in the, it's a bihar itself now this bajji kingdom was gana or sangha the gana or sangha has a type of government in which it is not ruled by a particular person but it is ruled by a group of people it is ruled by a group of people so that group of people may be thousands of the rulers each ruler will be considered or each person will be considered as a raja and these rajas used to perform a ritual sacrificial practices and they used to meet in the regular assemblies women slaves and kamakars agricultural laborers are not allowed to attend these assemblies only the rajas were allowed to to attend those assembly apart from the priest both buddhas and mahavira both belongs to this sangha sangha type of government all right then let's understand the ajat satru and the bajjis 
who were ajat satru and who were bajis bajji you know okay now ajat satru wanted to attack the bajis okay because you must understand the every strongest ruler ruler want to attack on the bajis or on the sanghas because they want to capture it they want to capture it so this ajat satru also want to capture on the bajis right they want to attack he want to attack or he want to capture so he sent his minister knock he sent his minister who ajat satru sent his minister the minister's name was basakara to to uh, you know to meet basically the bajis right now now uh, the buddha asked whether the bajis meet frequently in the full assemblies or not now you must understand they meet they meet in the full and frequent public assemblies they meet and acted together right they followed the established rule they respected supported and listened to the elders and bajji women were not held by force or capture now this is something you must understand that they had certain amount of harmonious relationship between the two all right let's understand the buddhism buddhism everyone knows about the buddhism okay now let us briefly understand the concept called buddhism or the religion called buddhism all right so first of all let's understand the buddha's life buddha ki life kya thi wo hame abhi samajhna hai what was the buddha's life all about all right so first of all you must understand the siddhartha the original name was siddhartha right he was also known as gautama so the original name was siddhartha siddhartha gautama and he was also known as the founder of buddhism right and he was born about 2500 years ago around 2500 years ago he was basically born now i told you initially that the buddha and mahavira both belongs to gana or sangha gana or sangha so the mahavira sorry this siddhartha gautam or buddha belong to a small gana that is called sakya gana sakya gana right because sakya gana and he was basically a kshatriya clan or he belongs to a kshatriya clan but he belongs to a sakya gana and like that there were different different ganas also now when he was very young right you might have heard this story i just telling you that story when he was young he left his home right uh, leaving his wife and children and all etc he left completely the kingdom right he left his home he left his gana everything in the search of knowledge now after he wandered for several years together he started wandering just from here to there in search of truth in search of the knowledge right uh, started holding discussions with other people thinkers etc and etc and so forth and he and he finally decided to find its own path to the realization after wandering for several years he decided that he will find its own path of realization so he started basically the uh, meditation for the several days together under a people under a people tree right at the bodh gaya in bihar you must understand so he started meditation and he started his own path to the realization right where the gautam buddha attained enlightened gautam buddha attained enlightened now after that enlightenment the gautam or the or the siddhart gautam is known as buddha buddha means the enlightened one or the wise one you are getting my point so after this buddha or sorry after the siddhartha or gautam when he got the knowledge or he enlightened right or he attained the enlightened uh, enlightenment he was known as buddha or the person who is enough wise enough or wise one all right now he then went to the sarnath near varanasi where he taught for first times aapko pata hoga aapne art and culture wali book mein padha hoga that he went he went to the sarnath and took his first you know um, interaction with the students so basically he taught for the first time he taught for the first time nearby varanasi at sarnath at sarnath and remaining rest of his life he was traveling right on the foot going from place to place right teaching the people right uh, spreading the knowledge spreading the enlightenment till his death and he died basically at kushinara right so you must understand uh, he was basically a founder of buddhism founder of buddhism now 
let's understand the buddha's teachings also briefly right how was the teachings of buddha all about okay so let's understand so first of all you must understand that buddha taught that the life is full of suffering matlab jab buddha chote the us samay buddha ko padhaya gaya tha ki the life is full of suffering and happiness there is nothing in the life every part you go or everywhere you go you will find only dissatisfaction or unhappiness and suffering so he was very deeply pained during the childhood and he decided that he will he will go and he will search the happiness right now uh, now now the point is that he found that this unhappiness and the suffering is is caused because of we have desires isn't it we have desires that i want this and if i if my desire is not satisfied i will suffer isn't it that is a natural outcome or i will be unhappy because my desire is not satisfied my desire is not satisfied and most of the time one cannot fulfill its all desires because it is almost impossible to fulfill all the desires okay so the point is buddha buddha basically you know uh, understood that thus there is suffering there is unhappiness in the society but that suffering and unhappiness is because of the unnecessarily desires and because of the cravings of the uh, toward those toward those desires right so so he basically said that even if we get sometime even if we get what we want we are still not satisfied right so we want even more we want even more and by that time we get more we will have more craving towards more so that will be that will be making ourselves more unhappy more suffering in the nature so that is something we should stop right that is something we should stop so that that is why he he basically founded a middle path founded a middle path so the buddha described this as a thrust or tanha right this is thrust your thrust of of you know uh, of some desire that you want so he taught that this constant craving could be removed by following moderation in the everything right you should not go very extreme of anything right that i want this it is not possible and it will unnecessarily give you a lot of suffering lot of suffering so he started saying that it should be removed by moderation in everything you should moderate you should moderate and you should achieve a middle path to achieve that one right and he also taught the people to be very kind to be respect to the lives of the others including the animals right and he believe that the results of our action that is called karma right the results of our action which we call karma whether the karma is good or bad affect both of us in this in this life or the next so that means he believes in the 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 effect of the karma of this life into the next life into the next life right so this is what the important point you must understand that the actions or the results of its actions will be even haunt the person in his next life as uh, as the gautam buddha also believed in that right buddha taught in the language of ordinary people that is parakrit you must understand the parakrit is a language of ordinary people now that language could everyone understand that language could everyone understand okay now briefly understand upanishad also what was upanishad okay so you must understand upanishad ka matlab kya hota hai sabse pehle to upanishad ka matlab dekhiye upanishad ka matlab hota hai approaching and sitting near theek hai upanishad literally means approaching and sitting near right so you must understand when you when i say i should when i say approaching and sitting near to whom to whom so i should say that there should be some persons who will be approaching and sitting near for what for what so that means for teaching for spreading the knowledge isn't it so that is why in the older period of the time the people or the students or the pupils used to approach towards a teacher a good teacher they used to sit nearby the teacher so the upanishads are basically text they are the text which contains the conversations between the teachers and the students now you must understand when i say these are the texts so these ideas which were there during the conversation that were presented through 
a simple simple dialogues simple simple dialogues they are basically text in the form of upanishad they are basically text in the form of upanishad now most of the upanishadic thinkers are men especially the brahmins and the rajas this is what also you must understand that upanishads are basically those texts which contains the conversation between the guru and the shishya the guru and the shish the teacher and the pupil or the students right often they are also called the ideas which were pre which were presented through a dialogues which were presented through the dialogues now these upanishads are basically or those upanishad thinkers are basically mostly rajas or brahmins now around this time right the buddha was preaching and also perhaps a little earlier other thinkers also try to find you know a different different answers to the different to the difficult question like one question would be why there is suffering in the world why there is suffering in the world the buddha found the suffering is because of the desire because of the desire that we have isn't it so like that the different different people were searching for the different different questions some of them wanted to know about the life after the death what will happen if we die okay other wanted to know why sacrifice should be performed there were different different you know uh, uh, the questions that are coming out so through this upanishad there were different things or different you know uh, uh, the interactions ideas were basically propagated to the future generations also now many of these thinkers which were only two either rajas or brahmins right felt that there was something permanent in the universe that would last even after death they believe in something which is permanent and that will be lasting even after that they described is it a atma unhone usko kya describe kiya atma atma ka matlab kya hota hai soul individual soul theek hai and brahman brahman matlab universal soul so you must understand ye jo concept aaya na atma parmatma wala ye concept aapka kahan se aaya upanishad se to upanishad mein jo thinkers the they believe that even after death there is a one permanent entity that we call atma that means individual soul and this individual soul ultimately merge with the the universal soul that is called parmatma so that is called brahman so these were two permanent entities according to the thinkers of upanishada according to the thinkers of upanishada and they also believe that ultimately both atman and brahmins were one you must understand both both atman and the brahmins were one and many of their ideas were recorded in the upanishad and they were part of later vedic later vedic text also so ultimately the concept called atma parmatma individual soul and brahmin soul and universal soul all came out through the upanishads through the upanishads right now let's understand the brief discussion about the jainism jainism right you might have heard about jaina right that the jaina is also called uh, mahavira mahavira right so first let's briefly understand the mahavira also who was mahavira just like a siddhartha so as we discussed that siddhartha who belongs to the sakya clan right or sakya sangha right like that the mahavira was most famous thinker of the jainas okay his name was vardhamana mahavira right who also spread its knowledge around 2500 years ago now you must understand <coughs> sorry both were contemporary on that time contemporary matlab dono ki dono ek similar time period mein rahe honge both were contemporary and both were spreading the message around this time around 2500 years ago now like like gautam buddha the jaina or vardhamana mahavira also uh, belongs to a kshatriya clan so he was basically a kshatriya prince of lakshavis lakshavi was also a sangha lakshavi was also sangha a group that was part of vajji sangha all right now just like a gautam buddha he also left home apni bibi bibi ko sab ko chhod ke chale gaye sab ko chhod chhad ke bole main ja raha hu jungal mein so he decided to go and left home and ultimately went to the forest okay 12 saal bhatakne ke baad jab kuch nahi mila 
राइट आफ्टर ट्वेल्व इयर्स ही लेड ए हार्ड एंड लोनली लाइफ ठीक है वेरी हार्ड एंड लोनली लाइफ एट द एंड ऑफ द ट्वेल्व इयर्स ही बेसिकली अटेंड एनलाइटनमेंट ही बेसिकली अटेंड एनलाइटनमेंट तो द पॉइंट इज दैट जस्ट लाइक ए गौतम बुद्धा हु आफ्टर स्पेंडिंग अ सिग्निफिकेंट इयर्स ऑफ द लाइफ राइट uh right they he basically you know started meditating under the people tree uh, at the bodh gaya and where he basically uh, got enlightenment right in the same way the mahavira also spending around 12 years at the end of 12 years he got enlightenment after uh, after you know doing very hard after after you know uh, covering very hard and the lonely life in the jungles all right now let's briefly discuss about the teachings of the jaina what are the different different teachings of the jainas that is there okay so let's understand the teachings so first of all he taught a very simple doctrine very very simple doctrine that the man and the woman who wish to know about the truth must leave their homes okay so he believes that if an individual individual want to know the truth they must leave their homes apni tarah hi sabko bolte the bhai aa jao bahar truth milega so it in in, in the form of enlightenment right so they so you want to promote the idea that the enlightenment you could find out right if you basically you know uh, if you basically do certain type of practices like right? so they must follow very strictly the rules of ahimsa according to him which means not hurting or killing the living even in the jaina cultivating of the crops is also prohibited if you know right they also consider the cutting of the cutting of the plants right as a, as a, you know grains is also considered prohibited in the jaina the point is that the strict jaina would strictly follow the rules of ahimsa that means they will not hurt or they will not kill any living including the plants also okay now being all being said the mahavira long to live to all the things life is very very dear okay now ordinary people could understand that the teachings of the mahavira and his followers they use parakrit just like a gautam buddha the gautam buddha also used the parakrit language the language of the ordinary people the mahavira also use the parakrit language as the language of the ordinary people there were several form of parakrit right now there were variants variants in the in the parakrit language which were different which were spoken in the different different part of the country right they were named after the regions right in which they have used for example if you say the the parakrit used in the magad area is known as magadi so magadi is not a different language but it is itself is a parakrit language right but it is spoken in the magad region so it is called as magadi it is called as a magadi so different variants are used but it should be used uh, the, the 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 region is used as a prefix of such uh, language now now let's understand a brief uh, uh, you know um, about about mahavira so the followers of the mahavira who were also known as a jaina who were also known as a jaina they used to have a very very simple lives so they started living a very very simple life they started begging the food theek hai jaise aapne jainas ke aap mein dekha hoga they also beg the food and they had to be very very absolutely honest right without any you know uh, any desire they should be very very honest absolutely honest and especially ask not to steal that means the person who is a jaina who is a jaina should live the simple life should beg the food for having right should live a very absolutely honest life and should never steal any item should never steal any item and they should always observe a celibacy also okay so these are some of the conditions that were uh, that were basically made right if the person is happened to be jina and men who had to give up everything including their clothes also so the jaina believe that if the person want to achieve this much right he should also give up his clothes also so apne clothes ko bhi utar do right they should give up their clothes also right so there were two sets or two sets right in the jaina one is called swetambara that is 
हु इज व्हाइट क्लैड सो जिनका बॉडी ढका रहता है राइट दे आर कॉल्ड श्वेतांबरा दिगंबरा तो मतलब कवर बॉडी पे कवर नहीं होता सो दिगंबर्स आर बेसिकली विदाउट व्हाइट क्लैड क्लोथ बट द श्वेतांबरा इज बेसिकली the body is covered with the white clad clothes right they were different these sects were basically originated uh, later period of the time okay now the jainism was supported by mainly by the traders okay because you might have seen that mainly the the people belongs to the jaina are the traders are the traders and moreover on that time also the jaina was mainly supported by the by the traders the point you should understand that buddhism spread to the almost all continents especially the asian continents south asia right east asia and it was you know covered the china japan cambodia vietnam thailand isn't it so the buddhism was spreading so much with high pace but jaina did not spread so it, it remains within india it remains within india and the farmers who had to kill the insects to produce their crops found it more difficult to follow the rules now you must understand because jaina says that you should not kill any living being if you want to grow the crops you should kill the insect so the so for the farmers it will be very, very difficult for uh, for observing this you know uh, the jainism the point is that over 100 of the years the jainism spread to the different parts of north india gujarat tamil nadu and karnataka so over the period of the time spread within india to the limited limited extent unless the buddhism buddhism spread outside india with a greater extent the teachings of the mahavira and his followers were transmitted orally for several centuries so there were no written traditions and these teachings were transmitted the teachings were transmitted orally right for several centuries together all right and they were written down in the form in which they were presently available at the place called balavi in the gujarat ever around 1500 years ago so this is all about your you know uh, your uh, basically jainism all right now let's discuss let's discuss about uh, <coughs> sanghas okay what was sangha okay let discuss about the sangha briefly so buddha and mahavira felt that those who left their home could only get true knowledge you must understand mahavira and buddha both thought that only those people right who left their home only could get the real knowledge isn't it now they arranged for them right uh, some sort of a grouping or some sort of a assembly right so that these people who stay there who left their home could stay together could stay together in the form of sangha sangha means a one form of association in which the person who left their homes can basically assemble and can basically live together the rules made for the buddhist sangha were written down in a book that is called binay pitik pitik pitaka so always remember the rules for for observance for those people who want to stay in the sangha or stay in the association were written down in a binay patika pitaka right from this we know that there were separate branches of the men and the women right because the rules which were there to be observed by the sanghis right or the sanghas from these rules only we came to know that there were separate branches for the men and women and only the men could join the sangha not women the only the men could join the sangha however the children had to take the permission of their parents and the slaves has to take the permission from their uh, masters to join the sangha is it it now those people who basically work for the king had to take the permission uh, from the king and the debtors who had to take the permission from the creditors like that the woman has to take the permission from their husbands whether to join the sangha or not right so so there were different conditions attached with the sanghas these all conditions we came to know that only through this binaya pitaka who was also known as uh, basically uh, a, a book where the you know the rules for the sanghas have been write down or have been written down 
Now, this man and woman who joined the Sangha led a very, very simple life, right? They meditated for almost of the time, right? They went to the cities, villages to bag the food for their sustenance, right? That too during the fixed hours, right? Now, uh, that is why they were also known as bhikkhus. Bhikkhus ka matlab hota hai beggar, beggar and bhikkhunis. Aapne word suna hoga bhikkhu and bhikkhuni. Bhikkhu, ek parakrit language mein, parakrit, the, the language of the ordinary people, the parakrit is a language for the ordinary people. In the parakrit language, the bhikkhus means basically uh, a beggar and bhikkhuni means bhikharin, all right, or beggar, right? So you must understand this is Sangha. Now, they taught others and help one another. So uh, these Sanghas or the people who used to stay in the Sangha, they used to teach, they used to teach the people that they should uh, help one another and they used to help the meeting to settle any quarrels that they took place within the Sangha. All right. So all such meetings were held regularly and those who joined the Sangha, including Brahmins, Kshatriya, merchants, laborers, barbers, courtesans and the slaves. Right. So you must understand these peoples basically joined. So there was no such defense uh, based on certain set, certain set of caste and certain set of other, you know, other parameters here. So you see here, slaves also joined, courtesans also joined, barbers also joined, laborers also joined, Kshatriya joins, Brahmin joins and merchant joins also. Many of them wrote down the teachings of the Buddha. Some of them also composed beautiful poems describing the life of Sangha, describing the life of Sangha. So all such things were basically uh, uh, basically were part of your Sangha. All right. Now let's understand briefly about monasteries also. Okay. So this is the last slide. We will discuss about the monasteries. Remaining one we will see in the last in the next class. So monasteries. Monasteries aapne dekha hoga. Both Jaina and the Buddhist monk went from place to place. Okay. Uh, why they went place to place so that they can spread their teachings so that they can spread their teachings throughout the years right now for permanent shelter monasteries were built right now you must understand because they need to make the monasteries for shelter purpose right so for shelter they they basically uh, 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 need uh, you know some place to stay for their stay a uh, monasteries were built now these were also known as Bihara so the Bihar jo hote the, wahan, wo, Bihar are those places where these monks used to live. Their monks used to live. Now, these Bihara, very at the very initial period of the time, they used to made up of wood, right? And over the period of the time, they started making uh, with bricks also, right? Some were stay even in the caves, right? That were dug out in the hills. And even in the Western India, very often the land on which the Bihara was built, donated by a very very rich merchant or landlord or king so you must understand many of the monks used to stay in the Bihara but few of them lived in the caves which were built on say on the hills and most of those lands on which the Bihara was built was basically donated by the rich merchants now the local people came with the gift of food clothing and the medicines from the monks for the monks so these monks were basically a bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis. They basically goes for uh, collecting those essential items, right? So these medicines, food and clothing were also given by, you know, uh, by the people to the monks. And in return, they taught the people. So that is how they basically profess. They basically, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, teach the people over the period of the time. Over the centuries, Buddhism spread to many parts of the subcontinent and beyond. So that is the beauty of the Buddhism that Buddhism spread to the many part of the continent, right, outside the India. All right. So after that, we'll study, we'll continue tomorrow. All right. So we'll bind up today's class. All right. And we will continue our class. We'll, 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 we'll end up our today's class here itself. So thank you very much for attending this session. Thank you.